It's yours, Shirley. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our last speaker for today, uh, Tina Termini. Uh, please tell us about your living history. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to tell you a bit about my journey. Um, I entitled this talk, Finding My Microenvironment, which is because I felt for a long time that I hadn't quite found my place. And I feel like I'm at that place now where I can help others find their place in science. And it's also a little bit cheeky because our lab researches the bone marrow microenvironment. So um, I would say that my living history is really an unexpected journey. I was not on a trajectory to become a scientist by any means. And there are two key messages that I take with me every day in thinking about how I got here and how I can help others get to where their goals um, will take them. So the first is seeing is believing and that there's power in community. So with regards to seeing is believing, um, you know, a term that we use often in the lab is, oh, I'm at the bench. And that means that you're working at your scientific workbench. Um, but for me growing up, when somebody would say at the bench, this was referring to a workbench, um, which was my dad's because he was a carpenter. So um, this concept of being at the bench had a very different connotation to me, but I still think about this as a place where you can be creative and build things and uh, use tools to ask different questions. Um, but because of that, I felt like I was at a disadvantage for a lot of my training because I am a first generation college student. Um, I'm Hispanic. I'm a woman. I'm from a financially and educationally disadvantaged background. So as I moved into college, which was always something that I knew I was going to do, I became became very aware that I was asking a lot of, you know, what is this experience? And that was everything from what is financial aid? What is work study? I had no clue what that is. How do AP classes work? Like, what is an internship? Can you just email professors? Like all these things were all brand new to me, but I managed to make it to college. And I'm really proud that I went to the University of Maryland College Park. But again, my journey to becoming a scientist started with this dream of becoming a musician first. So I studied music for most of my life growing up. I play the flute and I would say that music brought me into my most prominent mentoring experiences. So my first real mentor was Dr. William Montgomery, who um, was my flute teacher at the University of Maryland. So I studied with him for four years, one-on-one, -on -one, and this man was discipline. He was intense. Like he taught me so much about focus, using my subconscious, tapping into metacognition, like thinking about all these things, thinking about just learning. Like, how do you learn? Um, I remember my first flute lesson with him was me just playing one measure over and over again for an entire hour. I couldn't go any faster until I could play it 10 times in a row perfectly. And at the end of that, I think I felt very defeated, but he was like, well, now you know how to learn. So now you can go take this home and you're going to be able to play so much more and teach yourself even better. But he taught me to set those realistic expectations for like how quickly I could learn. Um, but he also taught me how to receive tough feedback. I mean, every week that we would perform in the studio, you got evaluated by your peers and you had to sign your name. So you had to, first of all, learn how to receive tough feedback from people and also give tough feedback to people. But I was pretty good, but I wasn't like a superstar. So he sat me down after my first um, my first semester and said, listen, you're here on scholarship. You're doing great, but I'm just not sure that I see this working out for you, you know, this dream of becoming an orchestral musician. And that totally crushed me. But I think it was some tough feedback that I absolutely needed to hear. Um, and he encouraged me to pursue another major. And he was like, you know, you're here on scholarship, let's make this worth your while. And the first thing that popped into my head was, oh, well, I really liked biology in high school. I had this amazing biology teacher, Miss Miller, who made transcription, translation, everything like so exciting. So I thought, okay, I like biology, let me take some biology classes. So I ended up graduating from the University of Maryland with dual degrees, my music degree and my biology degree. But to be honest, I had no idea what to do with these degrees. I was not giving up my music degree and the biology degree, I was kind of getting into that so late, I wasn't really even sure what I could do with a biology degree. Um, the only thing I knew of was medical school. So I was like, all right, well, I guess I'll be pre-med because when you're good at science and you're supposed to go be a doctor because that was kind of all I was ever exposed to. 
Um, so at the end of college, I ended up applying to research jobs, to medical school and to graduate school. Um, I ended up going to graduate school and let me tell you about how that happened. So I technically never applied to a PhD program. And again, that's because you don't know what you don't know. So I didn't know that I could apply to a PhD program. So in music, you need a master's degree to get a doctorate. So I was like, okay, obviously you need a master's degree to get a doctorate in science. So I made the mistake or it was kind of just a naive decision to apply to all master's degrees. Um, and uh, what ended up happening was that I submitted all these master's degree applications, even though I really wanted to be a scientist to be a PhD level scientist um, after having done some research experiences, which Dr. Montgomery totally helped me apply for. Um, so I applied to these programs and one program administrator contacted me to make sure that I didn't actually intend to apply to their PhD program. Um, she emailed and said, listen, your application's really strong. It sounds like you're looking for a PhD. And, and she said, we can actually put you in the PhD pool if you want. It's no problem. And to be honest, I wasn't even sure if my application was received because it was submitted in SurveyMonkey. So I legitimately moved on and kind of was like, I guess I applied to this PhD program. I don't know. But it turned out to be my only acceptance to a PhD program. And that's where I went. So for my graduate studies, I went to the University of New Mexico, which is in Albuquerque, and joined the biomedical sciences graduate program. And part of the reason I applied there is because of the geographical environment. So my mom's side of the family, um, we can trace our lineage back to um, the 1600s in, in New Mexico. So I always thought it would be amazing to go to school here and connect with the land. I have lots of family there. Um, so that was one of the reasons I applied, to be completely honest. I don't think I was very well informed about what I was doing when graduate, when applying to grad school, but I'm so glad because it worked out really well for me. And that is because I found a very supportive microenvironment. I worked with an incredible mentor um, named Dr. Jennifer Gillette who was my thesis mentor. And Jen was the first scientist that I saw that looked like me, that acted like me. She is brilliant, she's a genius, but she's lighthearted, a ball of energy, but also extremely serious, but very open-minded and welcoming of people. But she never compromised on her standards and I fit in finally, I felt like, oh my gosh, this lady like matches my energy and she, I felt like I didn't, I suddenly didn't have to hide anything about myself. I could just finally exist. I didn't have to change. I didn't have to mask my personality. I didn't have to like be very serious. I felt all the time, like in other environments, I felt like I had to kind of tone down my excitement or my jokiness. And with her, it was just like, yeah, just bring it. Like you can be your full authentic self in this, in the lab. Um, so you know, it was a really enlightening experience for me to finally be able to work with someone like that. And I got to work on this really cool molecule called CD82 and researching how that controlled cell adhesion. And it was also really cool to work with Jen because she was a new assistant professor. So she had been there maybe a year when I started. So I got to witness this blueprint for success, meaning her first grant, the first RO and the first paper getting to tenure. I got the behind the scenes look at the life of a PI from this little grad student you know, bright eyed, bushy tail kind of excitement. And I also got to see and learn about mentorship. So I had limited experiences working in the lab. So working with her, I got to learn how and, and see how she mentored people, how she customized that to different people and also how it could be a better mentee. So I became really inspired to become a PI myself. Um, and a lot of this was seeing as believing, like literally, I fell in love with microscopy. I felt so empowered by um, what I could do on the microscope. And a lot of that, again, came from Jen, who had such a strong background in microscopy. We would walk in these rooms with these home-built scopes, and she knew exactly what to do, exactly what to you know fiddle with. And um, a lot of these rooms were dominated by men. She didn't care. She had the confidence. And I, she totally built me up to feel empowered in that way as well. And I was able to acquire some absolutely beautiful images of different leukemia cells and present that also kind of combining my love for art and science as well. Now, one of the other things about Jen, when she was so open-minded, she really let me be myself in such a, a kind of crazy way too, because I ended up matriculating into the Master of Music program at UNM as well. So I graduated with both my PhD and my master's degree at the same time. And Jen was fully supportive of that. She didn't, she basically said, if you're, if it doesn't interfere with your research productivity and it makes you happy, go for it. Let's do it. She would bring 
the lab to my performances. I got to create some artistic uh, collaborations and she totally empowered me. So this is one of my favorite performances, which was um, me performing this piece called Density 21.5 while showcasing some of my favorite um, images of different molecular densities. So it was kind of this really cool opportunity for me to really tap into my artistic side without compromising on the sides. So um, I realize that scientists are just regular humans and you can be kind and have high expectations. You can work hard and be lighthearted. Some things that I didn't really hear or see were people sharing their struggles. And also PIs with similar uh, racial and ethnic identities to mine and openly speaking about mental health, I felt like it was getting kind of brushed under the rug. So one of the things I did worry about was whether I could actually make it as a scientist. You know, a lot of these people had so much confidence and they would never let you see them struggle that I worried, oh my goodness, if I'm struggling, does that mean that I'm not cut out for this life? But I, I forged on and went to do my postdoc at UCLA, um, fell in love with blood stem cells and regeneration. Here's a nice picture of my femurs in Hollywood from all the bone marrow imaging that I did. I decided that glycan ruled the world and I think this is still correct. Um, and I got to lead a really exciting project but I was more alone than ever in my life during my postdoc. I felt like everything was crumbling around me. The pandemic came, there was a lot going on in my lab and I did not know who to turn to. I was the only postdoc in my lab for the entire time I was there. I felt so isolated from everything. I was like one of a couple postdocs in my whole department. I wasn't ever invited to anything. It was just really challenging. Um, but then I come back to this, there's power and community because what I ended up doing is developing a lot of connections with people using Twitter. Um, so I used Twitter to connect with a lot of different postdoctoral fellows. And we formed this group called the Community of Scholars. And these scientists kept me going during some of the darkest times in my life. And I think we all kind of did academia differently in this nonlinear trajectory. So we had so much in common about how we got here and we helped each other navigate the job market, dealing with negotiations, also talking about resolving interpersonal issues with mentors and colleagues and mentees. I finally felt like I had people that I could turn to that I trusted and that actually understood my journey. So now I'm at Fred Hutch, which was really a fresh start for me where I'm able to um, lead my own lab. Here's me with my empty lab. Doesn't quite look like that anymore. Um, and it's been a really enlightening experience. And now I use Twitter in a different way. I try to be uh, you know, visible for others. So seeing is believing. I, you know, I really like to celebrate everyone in the lab and also share things in the lab that maybe are silly to some people, but I like to keep it lighthearted if I possibly can. And also celebrate all the wins. Like when this cryo staff finally came in, I was super excited. But I also try to keep it real in the sense that I like to share the rejections and the failures and the challenges and those feelings of isolation to let people know that I'm not always okay. And it's okay to not be okay. Like that is very normal. And um, it's actually been a great opportunity to show people that PIs are human. Like we all make mistakes. We learn from that. If we go through a challenge, somebody else might've gone through something similar and can offer insight. So I do use this as a mechanism to also just connect with people and share the things that are not so pretty all the time. So overall, the bench is where I feel the most comfortable, the most powerful and most creative. And my goal now is to provide others with that same confidence that Jen and other mentors and colleagues have instilled in me so that people can ask questions that people have never thought of before. I want people to feel comfortable at the bench and empowered. So that's my overall goal now as a PI. And, um, you know, this is only the start, hopefully, of my living history. So we'll see where I am in another 15 years. Thank you, Tina, for such an inspiring talk. Uh, and I'm applauding on behalf of the audience. Uh, I'll start with a question for you from the audience. Um, you spoke so eloquently about the relief of being your authentic self once you found an environment where that was appreciated. Uh, could you share how you found the culture of scientific writing and whether you felt like you needed to strike a persona to stimulate formal writing? Sorry, the, the what? can you repeat the question? Scientific writing, is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, how, how did you find the culture of yeah. scientific writing? Did you feel like you needed to like, put on a persona to simulate um, mm. formal writing? Yeah, I mean, it's really hard because I think we have an idea of what a scientist looks like or sounds like or acts like and breaking that down has been one of my goals. But sometimes I do find myself kind of 
feeling like I'm still in that box and I'm like, okay, is this a safe space to really be myself and really say what I want to say? Can I really write this in an email right now? Or am I going to be judged? Is it going to be permanent? All of these things. So I still find myself kind of having to check myself, but um, more often than not, I um, silence those thoughts toward just being myself in those rooms if I can, because if I'm not doing that, I don't know why I'm in this job, to be completely honest. I want other people to feel comfortable just being themselves. Um, and if I'm not setting that example, then I'm not sure that they will feel the same way. So at least in my lab, be yourself. Thank you. Uh, it's a great answer and a wonderful way to end uh, today's talk.